Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of QP Connects Health and Safety and COVID-19. I'm Brittany Nisbet, a member at large for QP Ontario and the co-chair of the QP Ontario Health and Safety Committee. It is my absolute pleasure to be the co-host of tonight's webisode, where we will discuss health and safety in COVID-19 times, along with the impacts that the COVID pandemic has had on marginalized and racialized workers. Tonight, I am joined by my co-host, Yolanda McLean, President of the CBTU Canada and Second Vice President for QP Ontario. I am so excited to have her here along with our three wonderful panelists. Thanks, Brittany. So can you believe this? We're actually in week 25 of living and working through the COVID-19 pandemic. It seems like just yesterday, and I tell you, there's been so many changes since March across Ontario, the country, and of course, the world that we live in. This pandemic really has brought health and safety to the forefront of everyone's minds. And we can't separate COVID-19 health and safety issues from those who are most affected, which are marginalized groups, because they are the ones who feel the impact more. For example, our housing crisis, our food crisis, of course, there are also folks that were working two and three jobs to make ends meet. And of course, now they can only work in one location, one job, less hours because of COVID-19. It is so sad that they actually have to decide whether or not they're going to work or feed their children or live or just figure something out on their own. Times are difficult for so many people. But tonight, our panel will answer some questions around reopening of workplaces in stage three, the correlation between minorities and COVID-19, and what we as QP members can do to help make a difference. So let's introduce our amazing panelists. So I'm introducing Tanya Williams. Tanya has worked in the healthcare sector for over 20 years and knows firsthand what it means to be a frontline worker. Her employment includes both acute and complex medical and long-term care facilities. Tanya is an advocate for injured workers' rights, women's rights, and gender equality, to mention a few, for over a decade. Tanya recently lobbied and worked with others to increase protections for healthcare workers, including changing laws to protect healthcare workers from violence. Aside from her activism and being a frontline worker, Tanya is a mother to a wonderful 10-year-old boy and enjoys spending as much time with him as she does advocating for others. So welcome to Tanya. The second panelist tonight is Paul Silvestri. Paul Silvestri is a servicing representative with the Health and Safety Branch of the Canadian Union of Public Employees. He advocates on behalf of QP members from the workplace sectors of healthcare, social services, municipal, school boards, and post-secondary. Paul has gained knowledge of the issues directly from workers in various and private sector workplaces across Southern Ontario through his many years as an activist and as an instructor. Paul's passion lies in consensus building among stakeholders towards bettering health and safety conditions for everyone in the workplace. Thanks, Brittany. And of course, I want to introduce our final panelist, Caitlin Gonzalez. Caitlin strives for insightful and nuanced discussions surrounding complex healthcare problems. She fiercely advocates for racialized patients to keep them at the core of healthcare solutions while championing for patient advocacy within racialized underserved communities. Caitlin passionately advocates for vulnerable communities to have equal and equitable access to healthcare. She is always expanding her knowledge of social determinants of health and new learnings under prisons and police abolish, abolitionist movements with a lens on understanding the nuanced intersections of race, sex, gender, and inequality. She's focused on the, right, the rights of health for all. And Caitlin has expertise in neuroscience, psychology, public health, and knowledge translation and the implementation in healthcare. Caitlin holds an honors in behavioral science in psychology, neuroscience, and behavior from McMaster University. Caitlin currently is a master of health science candidate in translation research in medicine, the Institute of Medical Science, faculty of medicine at the University of Toronto, and she's a proud member of QP 3902. Welcome, Caitlin. Let's get started with our panelists. 
So we've received, so we tried to get a number of how many questions came to us and uh, we stopped counting because there were so many. We realized how dear uh, this sort of topic is to folks and people are really concerned about like what's gonna happen next, our next steps. We've been talking about this quote unquote next wave that's coming and what that's gonna look like. But in the interim, people are really, really concerned about what's gonna happen right now. We wanna thank everyone uh, who took part in sending us those questions. I think they were all important. What we tried to do was try to like group them into like, uh, the word's not clumps, but like sort of like group them together so that we can actually answer most of the questions uh, sort of like, so putting two and three questions or ideas together into one. So hopefully your, your questions will be answered tonight. If not, we have the best panelists on tonight and don't worry, we'll leave you with their numbers so that you can find them at the end of this. So thank you so much for joining us, all of you. Paul, I wanna start with you. We're all experts here, so I know that you got the answer for this one. Uh, one of our main questions, or I should say the majority of our questions are folks asking around COVID-19 while we're opening uh, in stage three around the reopening of schools. Of course, we know that in other places, schools have already opened. There have been cases and some not. People are anxious because next week is the day when we start staggered um, reopening of schools. And what kind of accommodation can I receive from my employer if I have a family member who tests positive with COVID-19 or I live with someone who is immune compromised? Let's see, can you help us answer that? Thank you very much, Yolanda. So uh, under the, um, so the, the idea from the duty to accommodate comes from the, uh, come from the Ontario Human Rights Code and uh, under, under which that there's an obligation not to discriminate against a group of persons or a persons because of, uh, of a pro under the prohibitive grounds. And those prohibitive grounds are uh, race and sex, religion. Um, and ones that deal with COVID-19 that we need to look at are uh, not to discriminate based on uh, disability or family status. And a disability would arise if you yourself had uh, um, COVID-19 and you needed to be accommodated. Uh, but also what we look at as to whether or not a family member who tests positive with COVID-19 or if you live with someone who is uh, immunocompromised, that is where uh, there should be no discrimination by the employer against the worker under family status. And so the, once you've established that uh, you have, uh, you've suffered an adverse effect of discrimination based on, uh, on uh, family status, it falls upon the employer to, to accommodate the worker up to a point of undue hardship. And so for COVID-19, we've seen uh, all sorts of accommodations that have had to be met. Uh, so uh, there, but the, unfortunately not a lot of matters have advanced to the, to the human rights tribunal. So we're in a lot of new ground as it relates to the pandemic. Uh, but based on the previous decisions, we have a good, we have a good sense of uh, what kind of accommodations should be provided if uh, you have a member that you're caring for at the home, whether it be uh, an elderly uh, person or one of your uh, ch children that uh, you have to care for, um, is that uh, you would have to uh, demonstrate or to pr provide documentation as to, to uh, whether or not you are actually caring for that person. And if you uh, have a person who's uh, immunocompromised as well, uh, you have to establish uh, what you know what the, what kind of accommodation that is that is required. And they, it can look like different uh, accommodations are very uh, case by case driven. Uh, there's not one answer that I can provide, uh, but it has to be something that has worked with with the employer. And if there are accommodations issues, the union should be involved if you're covered under a collective agreement. Uh, so that could that could look the accommodation could look like many different things, such as working from home. It, it could look like uh, uh, alternating your shifts. It could uh, result in uh, changing certain duties or tasks that you do at the job, so that if you have someone who's a uh, who's at uh, that is immunocompromised at home, obviously you don't want to be going to a workplace where you're at high risk of uh, contracting COVID-19 and bringing that at home. So that's where that comes into the idea of the employer trying to find uh, a, you know, reasonable accommodations for you. And uh, so I would, I would check to, with your collective agreement to say what they say about leaves, if uh, you need to take a, a leave from work or if you're allowed to work 
from uh, from home and what that looks like in the collective agreements to ensure that no worker is being uh, penalized for having to uh, take an accommodation. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll uh, uh, the employer and when it comes to you know the, what uh, the employers are pushback on that is that they have to prove to the point of undue hardship. What that means is that um, they must accommodate you based on, uh, on your family status uh, up to the point of undue hardship. And we say, when we say undue hardship, that means that the, the cost of, of accommodating you would, uh, would financially have too burdensome on the employer. Uh, they would also need to look at other health and safety contingencies to ensure that no other person would be, or health and safety would be uh, affected by, uh, by you taking that, or by the accommodation that you are under. And secondly, is that, uh, thirdly, is that you also have to look at, has the employer explored all financial and funding options to permit you to, uh, to, to accommodate you in the workplace? Uh, and it is up to the employer to prove that. The, the worker does not have to say that, uh, does not have to go before the, uh, uh, the employer and have to demonstrate that they're gonna be impacted by undue hardship. No, it's the employer who has, who has, the, the, has to justify that, whether an undue hardship. So like I said before, it's, it's very case by case decision uh, the dependent. Each circumstance will be different. Uh, if you're covered by a collective agreement, reach out to your, your, your stewards. Uh, and if you have someone uh, to, uh, that you're required to take care of, uh, and you're going to have to provide a, a certain documentation about that. Uh, but like, like I said, a lot of that would be dependent on, on, on whatever um, accommodation that you require. Uh, so, but there's, uh, if, if you have any questions, I would, I would also direct uh, uh, people to the uh, Ontario Human Rights uh, Tribunal, um, the OHRC. Uh, .on.ca. Uh, they provide information that talks about accommodation um, and also uh, QP uh, QP.ca uh, has provided on their website on the COVID-19 webpage uh, information about accommodations in this new era of COVID-19. That's great. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm sure that everyone will find that so helpful. Uh, now, Tanya, you are an instructor with Prevention Link, which, uh, for those of you who don't know, Prevention Link is a disability prevention program that focuses on the link between the primary and secondary prevention of occupational injury, illness, and disease in the workplaces throughout Ontario. This program offers training, mentoring, outreach, and advisory services for unionized and non-unionized workers, workplace representatives, and the employers. So many of our members have been asking, uh, how will I know if I'm exposed to someone who tests positive for COVID-19 and what should I do or what steps should I take once that exposure has been confirmed? Could you please answer these questions for us? Good questions and thank you for um, bringing up these very important questions because Oftentimes, we're not sure about if you've been exposed or not because you may be asymptomatic, which is showing no symptoms, or pre-symptomatic, which is you may have a confirmed case but not been tested. If you feel like you've been, if you've been exposed to a confirmed case, to contact the COVID-19 centers around and make an appointment to be tested, it's still open. If you are confirmed to have COVID-19, contact your employer immediately. Contact your employer immediately and let them know. But also, the what you want to do is contact WSIB. Contact WSIB and notify them and file a claim that's with a Form 6 or an incident and an incident exposure form. You also want to know your treating practitioner that has confirmed the case to make sure that they are filing a form eight and the employer will follow suit with form seven. This way that you're covered uh, under WSIB during this, this time. So after you've notified WSIB, they will take on the claim, claim and continue their claims and they will begin contact tracing and help, help you through this process. Uh, thank you so much, Tanya. That's excellent information. Of course, I know this is probably a lot for folks to remember because Paul gave such great information and then Tanya, I was like, oh my goodness, I think I should have brought a pen. Uh, 
but maybe there is a way in the chat or somehow like folks can uh, sort of uh, give some folks help and maybe like even after this, a way that we can uh, send out some information. Cause I think all this information is gonna be great going into uh, um, what September and the reopening can look like of schools for sure. And I, uh, my question is for Caitlin and um, I, I have to say that what I, what I could, what my memory can serve me with is I believe that six QB members have already passed away from COVID-19. Uh, and I believe that four of them are racialized. And uh, I say that because I know that you've, you've focused uh, your work on advocating for vulnerable communities to have equal and equitable access to healthcare. So before in my opening remarks, I did say, you know, there are lots of uh, folks that have had to make a choice in like where they're gonna work instead of two to three jobs, what one place are they gonna work at and what one place will probably give them more money. And so like women predominantly racialized have had to try to figure out, uh, you know, how they're going to either feed their family or not go to work. And so, I mean, it's been very challenging. I appreciate the work that you're doing uh, and so for you, I wanted to know, like, what's been the biggest challenge during this pandemic for those that are uh, in vulnerable communities in regards to accessing health or just being able to prioritize health? Thank you so much, Yolanda. That's a great question. Um, the pandemic really highlights the capitalist environment that's really been chipping away at vulnerable communities' physical health, emotional health, and mental health for a long time. Black, Indigenous, Brown communities, LGBTQ plus communities, people who are houseless, and incarcerated people are all vulnerable populations that have always been the best self-advocates for their own health. It is incredibly stigmatizing when you as a human being and your health is not prioritized in the system, and you're not seen as valuable by a predominantly white healthcare system that's supposed to provide care for you. I've personally experienced that too, where I was denied access to urgent medical care on numerous occasions until it progressed to an emergency surgery. So with that, it's incredibly challenging when Black, Indigenous, and Brown people try to access healthcare or reach out for medical support, and in return, they're further stigmatized, they're gaslighted, they're not believed regarding their symptoms, and they're denied access to care based on racist beliefs, whether unconscious or conscious, from doctors who are often white or non-Black people of color. Additionally, with the pandemic's early emphasis on only accessing medical care when absolutely necessary to free up space in hospitals, it creates more barriers that make it difficult for these communities to get the access to care that they need. One tip my community member taught me is that when family doctors deny you access to further care, as a patient, you can state that they write it down in their patient notes and in their files that they're denying you from accessing X or Y treatment. And sometimes that alone can change their mind. But in all of these cases, we're expecting patients to be their best self-advocate to understand the nuances of a deeply complex, ever-changing healthcare system, to even be able to speak the same language as their doctor, and to be privileged enough to have the medical language to even demand better access to care. And that isn't the case for many of us. In these communities, prioritizing health is always in a delicate balance with grief, harm, and coping from loss. Black, Indigenous, and people of color and vulnerable communities often rely on their close-knit communities to move through the waves of balancing grief and their personal health. This never-ending grief can feel boundless, and it can feel like it swallows it up whole. And in all of these moments of grief, or mourning, or loss, when it feels like we cannot possibly take any more, these communities reach out to each other with a profound depth of love, grace, and empathy to uplift each other and rise above the world that wasn't really built for us. And these communities really provide the world with grace when the world has never treated them with dignity or grace. So when we prioritize our health first, it becomes a sacred act of self-care and necessary for our own survival. In a capitalist environment that really demands more from us, especially when we're empty, that continues to disproportionately harm Black, Indigenous, people of color, and vulnerable communities, prioritizing our mental, emotional, and spiritual health is necessary to survive. So in this delicate balance of grief in your health, it can feel impossible at times to put yourself first when people in your community are dying at the hands of the police or taking their life from the effects of racism in the workplace or university environment or from being gaslighted from their doctors for decades. In community care, we really feel deeply responsible for each other's health while holding each other in grief and uplifting each other in moments of joy. 
and all of it is challenging on a normal day. But in a pandemic, all of these systemic issues are on display for all of these communities to face in every decision that they make daily and to try finding new solutions for situations that keep changing where each decision can impact their sense of safety. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, so just going to open up these questions to everyone. So these are some really uncertain times that we're in right now. What are some of the best practices around health and safety that communities or workplaces should look into? So we'll start with you, Paul. Yeah, we've been like for QP, um, we've been advocating for a, a system of controls to protect workers and to protect the, uh, the community as well. Uh, masks alone are not getting us out of this situation. In fact, it, masks are considered the least desirable means to control a hazard like COVID-19. Uh, in occupational health and safety, we, we use a system that's called the hierarchy of controls to determine what is the appropriate ways to either uh, like eliminate or reduce exposure to a hazard. Uh, for COVID-19, we see many reasonable ways that uh, employers uh, and public health can, can work together to try and, and improve the community and the workplaces. Uh, some of those, uh, some of these like this, the system of controls have to be over overlaying like a basket so that if one breaks that there's also something else there to capture the people. Uh, and, and then it often happens with any, any kind of hazard, whether it be violence in the workplace, uh, whether it be discrimination, whether it be harassment, there, there's usually not one cause. And if you keep asking yourself, well, why was someone exposed to this? You have to ask yourself further why and why and why to really root out what are the systemic reasons why we have hazards in the workplace. And, and COVID-19 is no different. Uh, if you had serious health and safety concerns before, you have just as many with COVID-19. Uh, with, with, so well, I would say that things like isolation and distance are at the top of the hierarchy. So if you're able to isolate yourself and not be exposed to other people that have, may have disease because of the asymptomatic nature, then you, that, is, that is number one. Distancing is, is, number, is, key, is key in all this. Um, screening and self-assessment. If you don't know what the symptoms are, if you don't know what the, uh, if, you, if you're caring for someone and you have to send them to the school, uh, do you know what the symptoms are? Because they're different from adults and they are for children. So really know what, you know, are you have to do your own self-assessment, but you also have to self-assess for your, your, your children or screen your children before you send them to school, before you go into work every day check to see what this, what your symptoms are like. Uh, and that is not the only we, uh, the only thing we can do. We can redesign the environment. Uh, and this could happen in the workplace. This could happen in the community as well, is to redesign the workplace or the community so that we can create more distance. Uh, and that, in a social way, it's not something that is always beneficial, but we want to, in, to uh, create um, Usually we, we talk about breaking down barriers, but in sometimes in COVID-19, you have to install physical barriers uh, to just keep people at, to keep the spread, you know, to limit the spread. Uh, you want to limit the flow of people in, the, in, in, in a particular area. Uh, you need to make, maybe move furniture around, create more space. Uh, ventilation is key. Uh, as we learn more and more about uh, the, 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 the likelihood that this disease is also transmitted aerosolized uh, through talking, through breathing, singing, shouting. Uh, ventilation will help to ensure that the, uh, that the particles are able to disperse or dilute into the air or be exhausted from the workplace. Um, hygiene and disinfecting. So hand hygiene is still very important. Um, you know, if you, if you're not wearing a mask, you need to cough, you know, cough into your, your elbow and wash your hands after a hand sanitizer. And are we disinfecting the workplace, uh, you know, more frequently? Um, PPE is the last resort, uh, for, for protecting the workers. Uh, but in this case, it is beneficial to ensure that workers have the appropriate, uh, personal protective equipment 
for the task that they are doing. So uh, a lot of that, what, what is the appropriate uh, personal protective equipment comes from a risk assessment to determine what does your job look like? Where is the greatest risk for exposure? Uh, and what can we do to make put put you know put certain equipment on to protect you? Uh, uh, if all the other control measures either fail, you're going to have PPE at the end. But we want to ensure that all those systems and controls are in first because if you're just left with PPE, it's not always effective. Um, and you have to ensure that you're trained on the use, the care, and the limitations of your PPE. As people, some people think that masks are everything. It's not everything. There are limitations to masks. Uh, finally, I would, I would say for the community is testing and tracing. The, the insidious thing about this, about COVID-19 is that uh, 40 to 45% of people at some point have the virus and they don't know it. And they're not aware of it. And they're able to spread it to other people. This is why testing and tracing is important to ensure that once you are made aware that you've come into contact with someone or you've had a high risk exposure to someone with COVID-19 who have con since confirmed that they do have it, uh, we get that information out early so that the people can either self-isolate, they can get tested uh, so that they don't can, you know, perpetuate this uh, cycle of asymptomatic spread. So I'll leave it out there. Uh, and, and so the, my, my message here is that what are the reasonable precautions we can take? What are the things that we can do to create that system of controls so that no one falls through the cracks? That's great. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll move it over to you, Tanya. So what do you think are some of the best practices around health and safety that communities and workplaces should look into? Well, first of all, thanks, Paul. Paul has said a, a lot of what I was going to follow through with, but I do agree with Paul. Uh, social distancing, practicing social distancing is one, but the most important is keep informed about the changes through Public Health Ontario. It's very important that you know the, the statistics and know what's going on on a daily basis, which is changing every day, possibly. So if you can keep informed through social media to get the information that's accurate, you'll know what's going on. But also I would like to talk about the physical distancing that Paul was talking about in the workplace currently, we have spaced out even the workplaces to look differently environmentally. So my recommendation is, is that to look at the workplace environment that you're in, see how many people are in that space and make recommendations that way to reduce the amount of exposure or uh, come into contact with several people in that environment. A recommendation uh, also is maybe staggering times, but that can be looked at based on your environment. If it's not a 24 seven operation, it still can be looked at if you can get your job done from home, that would be another thing. Another thing that uh, I repeat with my, with my child going back to school is wash your hands, <laughs> wash your hands. Um, it, it, it does work. <laughs> <laughs> and and be diligent about it. And also, I can also say about you know the face covering. Thanks, Paul, for for um, su supporting that. And I do believe if you are able to to not only do uh, masks but face coverings, whatever if you're able to do. Um, and peer to peer support. Peer to peer support, in which let me elaborate. If a colleague you feel like they are not. Um, informed about a confirmed case and it's just uh, coming into the workplace, you wanna make sure that you are informing them and keeping them in the loop as a peer and saying, hey, you know, uh, this, there's been a change in status and that's where communication is key. And also keeping up with social media is key. In the community is to practice social distancing when you can. In some environments you can't based on the your household but do, do attempt to keep that social distancing and your bubble um, uh, small, small enough um, and make sure that you're supporting each other in education and proper social distancing and hand washing and all of the other protective measures to keep everybody healthy. That's great. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'm gonna bring it over to you now, Caitlin. What do you think? 
Thanks so much, Paul, Tanya, and Brittany. I agree with everything that Paul and Tanya mentioned. For communities and workplaces, best practices can look like consulting local public health experts on any recent updates to maybe some new policies. Um, and universities and large corporations do have an obligation to ensure that the workplaces are safe for employees, contract workers, and gig workers. However, we know that even major universities and corporations value profit over people, and they do not see the value of Black, Indigenous, and Brown people's lives but see them as disposable and acceptable losses in favor of a profitable capitalist economy. So best practices center around community care, self-advocating, trusting your instinct, and seeking expert guidance and support. We keep our own communities safe, so trust your instinct and always question things. Does this best practice have my best interests in mind? Do I feel safe engaging with this? What's my personal plan at work if I do not feel safe to go to work or to continue working should things change? Your sense of safety can change based on what's happening in your environment, and you always have the right to feel safe in your workplace and within your community. So engage with your community and always wear a mask whenever possible. Communities can take on so many different forms. We're in communities with our coworkers, our colleagues, our friends in our neighborhood, our family friends. Ask questions and consult others on what they're doing in their communities. As much as we experience all of this on an individual basis, our community feels this deeper impact of uncertainty, anxiety, stress, and grief all at once too. And we aren't alone in that. And as we learn more about the coronavirus and scientific literature is constantly being updated daily, it can feel overwhelming with the overload of information and the 24-hour news cycle. Some of us may have the privilege to turn out grief or the overwhelming news, but in most vulnerable communities, we don't have that privilege when we rely on social media as a tool for keeping in contact with our community members and to know what's really happening in our communities that won't make it to the mainstream news. So check the news source that you're reading it from. Is this a reliable Canadian or American? American journalism source? Are they citing any scientific studies? Are they objectively reporting facts and consulting infectious disease physicians or epidemiologists? Are they adding their own interpretation to it? See if you can find a few resources that you can rely on and check those sources for updates. I recommend covid19madesimple.ca. They have a website and an Instagram. They provide daily updates in visual charts and written form. It's based on local, provincial, federal, and international updates. And it's all from medical students and graduate students from the University of Toronto, UBC, McMaster, and West and they summarize the most important news updates for you. So that would be my best advice. Oh, thank you to all three of you. I, uh, it's a lot of information again, and hopefully, you know, we'll put these best practices, uh, not just into practice, but also into reality where it makes our communities uh, safe and healthy and not just for us and for our workplaces, but for our loved ones too. So thank you for that. I do have another open question for all of you. Uh, so throughout the summer, it's been reported that there's been a strong correlation between high coronavirus rates and low income and the conditions at work, visible minority status and low levels of education. It was also reported that there was an even stronger association between neighborhoods with a high number of coronavirus cases and those with a higher population of Black, Indigenous and racialized workers. Would you be able to give further insight as to why this is and what QP members can do to continue to advance this data collection that we've all been talking about? And I wanna start with Caitlin. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, I can add some further insight. So the first is acknowledging anti-Black racism in Canada and its dominant generational effect on Black communities across Canada. Anti-Black racism has been here for a long time and the pandemic has only focused our attention on it, but it's nothing new. It's been what community organizers, activists and advocates have been saying for years and decades. And this is consistent with the organizing we see from local community organizations like Black Lives Matter, Not Another Black Life, Toronto Prison Human Rights Project and the local community mutual aid organizations. So the combination of racism, low income, poverty conditions, poor work conditions, and the system of policing and being Black or Indigenous or a person of color has long been the systemic ways in which our Canadian society consistently and systematically fails entire communities of color and these generations. These systems work together as they have always intended to keep wealthy white people at the top and to ensure that Black, Indigenous and Brown communities stay where they are at the bottom. Without providing these communities with the necessary resources and the societal support that they need in order to, th to thrive. 
um, society would first have to see and recognize us as valuable in society in order for them to truly care about us to save our lives in these communities. Abolition literature and teachings guide and envision a world without the police and without prisons, and over decades of literature, they all share the common goal to abolish the systems that harm and kill Black people and rebuild them to focus on meeting the needs of Black and Indigenous people of color and uplifting these communities through community care. So interrogating, questioning, and criticizing systems that our world is created upon is the way to break it down and rebuild one that was made for us. Our current capitalist anti-Black systems have never benefited, have never benefited nor uplifted Black or Indigenous communities. Change starts with listening to, understanding, and believing Black, Indigenous, and Brown communities then the necessary action items to actually implement these changes. So yes, research on these communities is deeply valuable when it's done by community members and not by outsiders. We've seen dozens of facts come out about anti-Black racism and COVID-19. We know this to be true. We have research to back it up. And yet little to no actionable items are taken. Action is the necessary step that's always missing from the research we see in the mainstream news. So where's the implementation? Who's going to support Black, Indigenous, and Brown communities who rightfully do not trust Western medicine due to decades of stigmatization, racism, ostracization, and gaslighting? How are white physicians and white people in power going to remove themselves from power to ensure that communities can get the resources and the support that they need? Are we asking these communities what they need? Or are we, as society, assuming that we know what they need? These are all important questions that we need to ask ourselves and ask each other. So regarding specifically advancing data collection, QE members can help advocate for more race-based data to be collected in Canadian research. The United States currently collects the significant portion of any race-based data that we see in North America, but many barriers exist for Canadian researchers, and we absolutely need to see more Canadian race-based data. So as QP members, you can focus on listening to Black and Indigenous people of color, believing them, promoting them, and uplifting them into positions of power and in research positions, and ensure that you advocate alongside them, not in front of them. Most especially, listen to Black and Indigenous organizers in your local community who have been doing this work tirelessly for years and seek them as experts. As Angela Davis says, it's not enough to be, not be racist, you must be actively anti-racist. You must question these systems that benefit white people in power as these are the exact same systems that harm and kill Black and Indigenous people of color. From mental and emotional trauma and grief, from decades of racism, to begging society to see all of us as humans worthy of life, dignity, and respect. From systems of policing that have unlimited power over us in society with no consequences for whose lives they can take, to the daily microaggressions that Black and Indigenous and Brown people face on a daily basis in their workplace and in their communities. So almost always there's Black and Indigenous people of color in your workplace and in your communities that have been fighting for their right to a safe and healthy workplace or community where they've either reported harassment, retaliation, racism, discrimination, predatory behavior, misogynistic or sexist behavior, and they've always been fighting these battles that none of us see in the mainstream news. But these are battles that eat away at our self-worth, our dignity, and our sense of self not being believed, being gaslighted, and fighting these battles alone or with little support creates unfathomable environments where the thought of job loss or retaliation is far too great to risk in a pandemic. So as QP members, my advice to you is ask how you can support Black and Indigenous people of color in your workplace and in your community. Ask how you can support racialized people in your workplace. Non-Black people of color and white people have a responsibility to use their power in society to align themselves with Black and Indigenous people in abolishing anti-Black racism, sexism, and misogyny in the workplace and in our communities. Because caring about each other is how we're going to survive this pandemic. Well, thank you so much. So insightful. I really, really appreciate uh, your inspirational words and a way to move forward. I think that's really important. So thank you. Uh, Paul, you're next on my screen. So why don't I go over to you? <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, I spoke earlier about the, the, the concept that if you had health and safety problems before, um, COVID-19 was just, you know, it, it made it just, it just has a, it was exasperated for the, for the problem in our in in some of the workplaces that QP represent have got where QP has members um, in the in, in some workplaces where there are visible minorities uh, they are chronically underfunded they are chronically understaffed and it, it's it's not surprising that these workers would have higher rates of infection 
uh, and that, and like I said, I wouldn't stop. We won't stop at COVID-19. We're going to keep asking ourselves, well, why? Why are why are these why are these uh, uh, these particular workplaces targeted and have so many either accidents, illnesses, injuries, and why we need we need to look at what what else is going on in the workplace? You know, uh, I mentioned earlier um, it might be might have high uh, incidence of harassment, might have a high incidence of sexism, discrimination, racism. These are all part of a of a problem. They're all part of a, a a system that needs to be rooted out. And the Occupational Health and Safety Act is, is, is certain legislation that was developed at a time where they looked at industries, they looked at construction, and who wasn't considered when that legislation was developed? Were they considering you know, works that are, or jobs that were um, traditionally occupy, uh, occupied by, by women? Um, that was the legislation framed in such a way to understand that uh, different workplaces um, have different needs. Um, so things like healthcare were not considered uh, when the legislation was developed. And still, there um, things when it comes to a healthcare problem like COVID-19, we certainly see that the gaps are there. Um, in workplaces that are underfunded, understaffed, that aren't healthcare related. Um, we would expect these, this, you know, these, these workplaces to struggle with those multiple layers that I was talking about earlier, and, and it all comes down to the this idea that the workplace parties are supposed to be the best to to solve health and safety problems, but if the workplace struggles with discrimination and racism, how can we expect them to protect the vulnerable workers? QP as an organization needs to continue to under understand the profile of its members, um, and I know they're 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 attempting to learn as much about the membership as possible through these these they fill out these 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 cards at all of our events to try and get a good understanding of what is the profile of our members, so that we need to ensure that all members uh, have an equal opportunity to be part of the you know this union organization that we belong to. Uh, to be part of the system of, of this uh, this this way to 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 advocate for all for all workers and for the community, uh, and that means ensuring access to that ensures that all the members have access to union education programs, for like being a steward, to be a member of your joint health and safety committee, so that you know we're able, and and each local has to ensure that it's their their executive is reflective. Of, of of our of our membership you know? and so rooting out racism in our in our locals is essential to ensure that you know executives and stewards and joint health and safety committees uh members are reflective of what we really are you know the what we really want uh and what we're where we really should be so i'll, I'll just leave it at that uh, thank you so much. Thanks for uh, encouraging us to and giving us some good places to go to. We are QP members and we can't forget about the good education that we have. Absolutely. So thank you. Tanya, I'm going to go on to you. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Paul, for the, the support and the information. But I believe precarious workers tend to be Black, racialized workers and immigrants. With the systemic gaps in the neighborhoods, racialized workers, visible minorities, and low-income working class are more impacted and under-resourced and lack services that would support the neighborhoods where they live in. The high number of cases of coronavirus amongst the minorities may be caused by overcrowding in housing, which is one of the main issues, and access to testing centers that are both often too far away and lack access to. My recommendation is that QP offer their support to the groups that are working on change and to help amplify the message of the people in power. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Tanya. I'm glad you said that because I also just wanted to sort of like add a little piece in here. I'm like you three of you are talking and I want to jump out of my seat and like scream for many reasons. 
you know, I say this all the time and um, people have already heard me say, when people ask me how I am doing, um, I always say um, I'm happy and I'm angry and sad at the same time because of what we are going through. As a lived experience, of course, I'm speaking on behalf, of course, as a black woman. And I mean, I feel sad because the rise of hate and violence, uh, the increased uh, volume of like our members and not our members that are not understanding Um, the rise of hate and white supremacy, uh, you know, all the shootings are also included. Uh, this COVID didn't, these things didn't happen because, because of COVID. The COVID has enlightened these things and made them greater, of course. And so uh, I also have to say that I'm very hopeful. I'm hopeful because it's great to see folks like us that are in the labor movement and also outside of the labor movement, uh, making decisions, going out and marching and protesting. And I've said this before, you know, sometimes they don't even know what they're marching for, but they know they want something different. They know they want a world that is different. They know that uh, because we are in COVID and because we see, you know, uh, greater housing pr problems or, you know, uh, uh, greater health problems, or we see our, our own uh, brothers and sisters dying in front of us and being sick more in front of us, they know that they want to change. And they know that they, there can be differences. And so when I see them out on the streets in places that never had a march before, never knew how to organize one, but they have figured it out, uh, it's because they want a world that's different and they want a world that's better. And we also like, I mean, Paul did talk about um, uh, education, which I think is so important. And uh, of course, Caitlin talked about marching on the street. And of course, after she finished talking, I thought I could just get up right now and put on a mask and go outside and hold up a sign. But since I'm co-hosting, I should just sit down here and just be excited in my skin here, <laughs> all by myself. And after hearing, you know, Tanya just tell us sort of, you know, like things have to change for the better. I think we, uh, we as QP have an opportunity uh, not just in this panel, but uh, even the, the, the panel prior and the one coming up about being an ally and an important ally. We as QP, uh, it's upon us to actually uh, do things for our members and work with our members so that they can see a change. And I also want to talk about politics. Um, of course, it's not in my notes, but you know, I have to always talk about, you know, it's going to be uh, important at the ballot box and what the ballot box looks like at the end of the day. And these, that's why we have to keep having these kinds of conversations. Uh, we have to keep talking about uh, what our members are going through, even through COVID, and how we can help them see uh, what is a better life for them so they can also be hopeful at the end of the day. And I think that is really important. And uh, of course, that's a whole other subject that we'll talk about some other time that someone's probably texting me saying, don't go off topic and don't talk about politics and don't, but you know, if I don't add that in there, uh, we could have a government that uh, we have now that's maybe not like in our favor. And, um, and uh, so that's why I think it's important for us to add the education that Paul talked about, being on the streets and talking about the data collection that Caitlin talked about, and also talking about a better world that Tanya talked about. And we can only do that uh, through elections, of course, at, uh, and uh, that's for a different topic, but don't worry, I will, I'll make sure that I get on that webisode for sure. Uh, so thank you so much to all three of you for your important, important insight and your uh, encouraging words tonight. Over to you, Brittany. Sorry, I took up your time. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's totally okay. It's honestly like you. I'm so glad that you said what you had, what you did because those are. It's yeah. You are right. Like we always have to talk about politics in all of this as well. So I'm really glad that you brought that up, and I'm glad that all of you mentioned the points that you did because it's all very important information that we all have to know. And we all have to keep in the back of our mind as we continue forward. Um, so yeah, just our final question before we wrap up tonight. Um, so as workplaces are reopening with stage three, children and education workers are heading back to school and the discussion of a second wave is growing. So what is one message you would want folks to know about keeping themselves and their family members safe? So we will start with you, Tanya. Prevention, protection, and education go hand in hand. 
therefore in the future as stage three we are presently in you'll keep that in mind moving forward to keep your family and your children safe and your workplace keep informed and engaged <laughs> Perfect, thank you. And um, Caitlin, what is something that you would like to say for everyone to remember? Yeah, I agree with everything we mentioned earlier, especially around prevention and social distancing and wearing masks. Um, and one message for keeping yourselves and your family members safe is really to focus on community care and your community support. We are all part of so many different unique and deeply meaningful communities in our lives. So reach out to your community, your coworkers, your family friends, your childhood friends, your lifelong friends, your neighborhood. All of these are different communities that we're a part of and that are deeply meaningful to us. And they bring us joy and a deep sense of safety during uncertainty. So rest as long as you need to, take care of your body, your mind, your spirit, and take care of your loved ones because caring about each other is the only way we're gonna survive this pandemic. You are absolutely right. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And Polly. Uh, so I'll, I'll just say that um, one, one of the things I advocate as much, and it's not always the easiest thing to do is if you see, if you see something, say something. Um, if things don't look right, um, we need to speak out. And under the um, under the Occupational Health and Safety Act, it, it, I can say for, for workers that it is a duty of the workers that if they see something in, in the workplace that could be a hazard to them or to another worker, they have a duty to bring that up to their supervisor or to their employer. And with that information, the employer is bound to take reasonable precautions to to remedy the situation uh, and there are several creative ways and we talked a little bit about about them tonight of, of how they can they can reduce risk and reduce exposure and improve the workplace conditions what is the the, the intention of the legislation is to prevent accidents injuries illnesses incidents uh, anything that's that's an adverse effect on on the workers so I would, if you're, if you're not satisfied with the response, um, if the employer has not brought that risk as close to zero as possible or at zero, you, you can uh, engage with your Joint Health and Safety Committee because they are uh, engaged with the employer to, to their mission is to, is to you know, identify the problems in the workplace, identify the hazards and to make recommendations to make the workplace better. Uh, so engage with them. Uh, and there's a lot we don't know about this, this virus. And we were talking earlier about education. Um, I'm, I, that's one thing I think I, 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 I've always believed in is that, you know, the uh, information, like uh, it has to be accurate information, it has to be information that, you know, check, check, check the biases, check the author, check, check who is producing the materials. Like, um, but if we, but we can start by, you know, eliminating those, uh, those myths that are out there that are politically charged. Um, sometimes you don't really notice that they're politically charged or they're racially charged um, uh, to find out, you know, it's, what is the truth out there and, and, and to educate yourself to find out because uh, we're, we're learning so much about this virus as we go along and we need to look to, play, to let the best system as possible. Uh, if you're a parent and you're sending your child back, um, your concern is understandable. Uh, there are knowns and there are unknowns. Uh, we know that cases at schools are inevitable. Uh, we all know that this is likely to happen and it's going to be driven by the community transmission. Because right now, there's the COVID-19 is not in our schools. And it's going to come from the community. So if the community is working together as a whole, to try and eliminate, uh, you know, and to put that those controls in place, um, wearing the masks, distancing, um, it will help. Ultimately, it'll drive whatever happens in the schools. Uh, so, early detection, testing, contact tracing will ultimately decide if a school is just has one or two cases, or if they have an outbreak. Uh, and it's it's important that uh, the communities don't drive the case. So as a community, stay at home if you're sick, you know, monitor your symptoms, uh, personal hygiene, as we said earlier, wash your hands, uh, mask, not to protect you, but to protect everyone else uh, and to reduce unnecessary exposure. You know, uh, 
if I've been watching the epidemi epidemiological cases that have been increasing over the summer, um, ages 20 to 35 were in the minority. And all throughout the summer, we saw the cases increase, increase, increase. And a lot of that was driven by people at bars, parties, people that are being irresponsible. And this is, this is what we don't need. Uh, so reduce your unnecessary exposure, avoid crowded areas, and we encourage testing. Uh, it's not the be all end all, uh, but testing will help us uh, give an early indication as to uh, uh, whether or not you have the, the virus. Um, and let's, let's, let's you know, not deal with those myths and not deal with those, uh, those politically charged stories that are out there. And um, uh, public health has some really good information about for, for the community, but uh, in, in our workplaces at the end of the day, um, it is the employer who is responsible for our uh, health and safety. We have duties, we have rights. Um, we have the right to participate. We have the right to know about the hazards in the workplace. We have the right to refuse unsafe work if we believe that the employer is not providing that system of controls that we're talking about. And you have the right to raise issues in the workplace without fear of reprisal. And if you are a victim of reprisal, there are uh, methods that we can go about to uh, bring your case forward and make sure that you're made whole at the end. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. And thank you to Caitlin, Paul, and Tanya. It was such a pleasure having you all here tonight. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. And thanks again for all of your questions. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed tonight's panel as much as we did. Stay tuned for our next webisode, From Ally to Accomplice which is being moderated by our very own Don Bellrose, our chair of the Indigenous Workers Committee. And that'll air in a few weeks time, so stay tuned for that. Have a great night, everyone, and thank you. Thank you, have a good night.